Oh, Angela was saying, is that the, is that, are there any more songs? That was so beautiful, wasn't it? Uh, I really love that last song that we had today. Thank you, God. Thank you, God, and thank you, Jiang, for playing it so beautifully for us today as well. I want to open in prayer today. Let's, let's bow our heads. Father God, thank you for the people, your people, who are here today. Thank you for their lives and how they've stepped away from the world's way into your way. And we pray, Father, I pray that as we sung that you'll continue to abide with us until the, the work is done and that there will be a tremendous work that will be done not only by this congregation but by many congregations your people all around the world. Oh God Almighty, pray for your guidance as I bring this message today. I pray that the Holy Spirit will lead and, and touch us as we hear this, your holy word, uh, your reliable word, as, as Brother Shem reminded us, and, and Mary, uh, sorry, Wendy reminded us today with her reading. Your word stands forever and we thank you that it is so rich and pure. And that is the word of life, everlasting life. So, Father, I pray, may you bless this message in Jesus' name. Amen. When one word changed everything. I think I'll take this off today. When one word changed everything. Mary Magdalene was weeping. She wanted to know where... Jesus' dead body was. He was standing by her, but she didn't know that it was him standing right there. She saw him. She didn't know it was him. Jesus asked her, why? Why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She still did not recognize him. She didn't recognize his voice even. She supposed he was the gardener. She, and she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. At first, Mary Magdalene completely missed the presence of Jesus. And then one word... Just one word changed everything. And that one word, what was that one word that changed everything? Mary. Mary. And then when she heard her name, as we see in John 20, 16, that changed everything for her. And how, how was that word spoken? Uh, it has an exclamation mark. In, in our Bible, but do you know that punctuation, exclamation marks, they weren't even invented at that time. So how, how do you think she said, he said Mary? Do you think it was with an exclamation? Oh, just quietly. Just quietly? Anybody else? Just quietly? Anybody says it with an exclamation? Mary. No, we just have quietly. Okay, that's interesting. I, I thought it would be Mary. It's me. To let her know that he wasn't the gardener. It wasn't supplied in the text. You who say quietly might be right. However, he said the word, her name, Mary. It changed everything. She, she recognized, oh, it's you, Jesus. You're alive. You're alive. Is there one word that we could say that could change everything for somebody that we know? Or are there maybe just a few words that we could say that could change everything for somebody? How about the word sorry? 
sorry. If we said sorry, could that change everything for, for someone? How about thanks? Thanks. I really appreciate you and what you've done. Thanks. What about I forgive you? Is there somebody we need to say I forgive you to and it could change everything for that person? Or how about I love you? Marry me! Or in response to marry me, yes, one word can change everything. How about the two words, you're special? This, is there one word or just a few words that we could say to someone that could change everything for them? Firstly, as we heard last time I preached about this, Jesus said to Mary, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? And she didn't recognize him. But now he says, Mary. Mary and immediately she knows that it's that it's him oh, oh brethren let's be more personal with one another let's learn each other's names and let's use the names I really appreciate Rich and Alistair who make a special point of knowing everybody's name but not only knowing their name, that's not enough for them. They've got to pronounce it right. What's your Korean name? Not just your English name. And I really admire that. Let's learn each other's names and let's use them. How many people here know all of the children's names in the church? They're very special to us as well. And... We could really encourage them in the way of Christ, in the way everlasting, in eternal life. We could guard them against dangers in this world. If, if they know that we care about them, that this church, as we've just been discussing, is full of people who love one another and who care for each other. It's important to know people's names. The second part of verse 16 it shows that Mary finally recognizes Jesus. She turned to him, she turned and said to him, Rabboni, Rabboni, which is to say, teacher. It, it's interesting here to observe how, how he used her name after first calling her woman, woman, and then she doesn't use his name. She says instinctively, Rabboni, which is to say teacher. Now, Rabboni, Rabbi, is a title. It's a title of honor for, for, for a teacher. Um, it's an official term for a respected teacher. Rabbi, Rabboni. And... It's a common way that the disciples addressed Jesus. It's a common way. They call him rabbi. What are some other common ways that the disciples addressed Jesus when they were directly speaking to him? Master. Master, yes. Lord. Lord. Yeah. Teacher. I find it... Um, could I find, as I searched for one example in the New Testament, when... The disciples, John, Peter, James, as they were directly talking to Jesus. Could I find one example, though, when they said Yeshua to, to him, when they were talking to him? Hey, Yeshua. I couldn't find one example. Why? Uh, and I, I, I think we can understand why when we understand uh, our society, even today. That when somebody is in a place of authority over us or in a high position, it's not normal for us to call them by their name. It's even, sometimes it's disrespectful. Think about, for example, children. 
Do the children say, hey, ji young? The children say, say to, to their mum, no, they call her mum, mum, usually. They call their dad, father or, or dad. Their grandparents, grandma, nana, grandpa. Even as we think of, at God, when I went to school, we didn't call our teacher by their first name. We, sir or, or miss. Maybe by their missus or maybe by their last name. When we go to court, Chim, just go to the judge. Hey, Bob. I submit, Bob. Bob, hey, Bob. Please let my client off lightly today. Do you, do, or what do you say? Your Honour. Your Honour. Yeah. So Mary, when she saw Yeshua alive, she says, Rabboni. She says, Rabboni. Probably, uh, well, I'm not going to say probably now with the exclamation mark because uh, we have different points of view on that. that that's okay. But I was going to say probably with the exclamation mark of excitement. Rabboni. Sorry, sorry, Mary. She, sorry, Mary said. We had disagreement over whether Mary was spoken softly or with an exclamation. But what about when she saw Jesus? Do you think there was an exclamation mark there when she said, Rabboni, I've got nods over here. Rabboni, she was happy. She was joyful. Now, imagine her joy in that moment. Imagine her excitement in that moment. She had been weeping sad tears. And now... She's probably weeping tears of joy. Is that possible? Has anybody ever done that? Gone from weeping sad tears to immediately weeping happy tears. Anybody done that? I, I haven't. Yes? So it's possible that she might now be weeping tears of joy as she has seen that, that Jesus is alive. Shall we just pass over her joy now and go to the next verse? Um, at seeing Jesus alive, and, and should we just move on to the next verse? Should we just, just go straight over that and go to the next verse? I don't want to do that. I don't think we should pass over her joy at this moment. I think we should explore it and, and rejoice with her. Remember Romans 12, 15. We had this about two weeks ago. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. And, and when we were looking at her weeping, no, we did not pass over her weeping. We, we explored it, what she was feeling, why she was feeling it. We empathized with her and I encouraged you in your relationships, encouraged us in our relationships to enter into those emotions, those feelings that our spouses, our fiancés, our children, whoever matters to us, enter into those emotions that they're feeling and respect them. Be there with them in that feeling. Now, I want to give you a test here. I'll give you two examples of how to respond to something, and you tell me which one is the weeping with those who weep, a kind of weeping with those who weep. It doesn't have to be crying, but you're... Let's say um, you're a male and your wife rings you. I've just had a car accident. The tire of the car, it blew out and I lost control of the car and I'm really shaken. And the first husband answers, oh, where are you? I can be there immediately with my toolkit. I'll come right around and I'll, I'll fix it for you. What, what's the address? Or the other one says, Oh, honey, I can feel that and sense that you're really shaken. I mean, I could come straight away, but, but are you okay? Do you want to talk about it before I rush over? Look, I'm really concerned about you, darling. Please, um, just share with me. I want to encourage you. Are you okay? Which one of those two was really connecting and being with? Sorry? The second one wasn't just thinking about, oh, logically, okay, now, what must I do? I can do this, I can do that, I can help you with this, taking on the logical approach. No, that's, this one was trying to identify and be with her in her grief, in her, in her distress. And sometimes as uh, 
men, we are a bit too logical and we forget about the being with in the, that experience. Now, I have to make a terrible confession again today. I, I, this is getting to be a bad, um, bit of a bad habit for me lately. I have to grow more because Angela rang me this week. And she, she was going around Barks Corner roundabout and she wanted to turn into Marshall Street. So you've got one road on the left to Pice Park, then you've got the road down to Tarico, then you've got Marshall Street where the golf course is, and then you've got Cameron Road, and she was in the wrong lane. She was in the, in the inside lane and she just stopped and waited for cars to go by her and she froze and was very anxious about that. And I just, she told me, and I said, oh, you should have just kept going around the roundabout, done it again, and changed lanes and go down there. What, why is such a drama queen? <laughs> that was bad. That was, that was the wrong thing to say. That was worse than example one. <laughs> Way worse. So, terrible. I, I don't... You know, I, I, maybe I shouldn't even confess it. No, it says in the Bible, confess your sins to one another. Pray for me that I get back to that place of weeping with those who weep. Anyway, let's get off the weeping and to the rejoicing. This sermon is about the rejoicing now that Mary experiences. We appreciated how much Jesus meant to Mary when when she was weeping, when, when she was at her lowest low, when she was just, where's, the, where's his body? We appreciated how much he meant to her. But now she exclaims, Raboni, Raboni, you're alive. Let's rejoice with her for a little while. Let's rejoice with her in her emotions on a personal level. level. Her great friend had been resurrected. Her great friend had been revived. The one who had rescued her from how many demons? Seven. Seven demons had been revived, had been resurrected. And here he was standing right next to her. Her relationship with him could continue. He had been vindicated. Oh, what, what a joy she would have been experiencing. Can, can we rejoice? with her in that moment and what she was experiencing. Her commitment to him had been vindicated. Her hopes are revived in a wonderful way. He's alive. We can rejoice with her. Her life has true meaning because Jesus is alive. Her life has ongoing purpose because he's alive. He's not in the grave anymore. Everything that he has said has been true. There's a future. There's a hope for her, for, for, for everybody, for Israel. There is hope for the world. Oh, brethren, just as we appreciated how important it is to weep or to empathize with those who are down, those who are struggling, those who are weeping, those we're in close relationship with, it is also very important to our relationships that we rejoice with them when they're rejoicing. Did, did we hear about the rejoicing? Why did I test question? Why did I choose the reading of the prodigal son, do you think? How does that relate to this sermon? Because once he was dead. Amen. And the rejoicing... He didn't just say, oh, I'm glad you're back. Yep, yeah, yeah, there's your bedroom. Pack your things over there. He killed the fattest calf. He celebrated. He, there was music. There was dancing. There was rejoicing with him. That's why I chose that reading. It's just as important with us in our relationships with our children, with our fiancés, with our spouses, with our loved ones, wherever they might be, that we enter into their joy and rejoice with them, connect with them, be with them in that. Here's another example. A, a boy comes home from school and he's got a trophy. He's won a trophy. 
and he shows his trophy to his dad. And he's like, so dad, look, my name's on the trophy. And so the first dad, he, he says, oh, wow. Well, oh, uh, let's go put this in this trophy in, in, in a special place. We'll put it up here. The boy can't even reach it. And then the other dad, he, he, he sees the boy jumping around the, 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 the lounge room, acting like he's won Wimbledon. He's, he's jumping on the sofa and he's trying to like go up to high five everybody. He's trying to high five the, 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 his family, his fans, his coach. And the other dad sees that and the other dad just joins in with him and starts jumping on the sofa, high fiving him, celebrating with him. That second dad was with him in his joy, was rejoicing with him. And I want to share a, another terrible confession um, in my life. Some of you know that I was previously married. I don't know if everybody knows that, but I was previously married before Angela. And this scripture, when I was reading a book and it was telling me what I'm preaching you today, I was just crushed. Because I thought I'd been a good husband. I couldn't even understand why the marriage was going to end. I thought, what is she doing? I was so angry that I couldn't continue what I wanted to continue for life. As I promised and as I would have continue, uh, done and, and I wanted to do. And when, when, when I was, was given a book on marriage and relationships called Never Alone, what the author wrote about this verse, it convicted me. I wasn't as great a husband as I thought I was. And I could finally understand why, why she chose to leave. And I realized one of the worst things that I ever said. And I can even remember where I said it. We were just driving along a regular road, going over a railway crossing. And I remember, I'm pretty sure it was at that spot where I said this thing. And I, she didn't really react from my memory. But looking back, what I said was, I think it was probably a key reason. If, although she never mentioned it as a reason, I think it was a key reason why that marriage failed. I said... Oh, look, um, I've been to Europe with you once. She loved going to Europe. She had relatives in Europe. She loved travel. And I said to her, I'm not going to go again. You can travel there on, on your own in, in the future. And I, I realized that the things that, that, that your, your partner, your loved one, your children, the things that they enjoy the most, if you don't enter into that with them, if you don't rejoice in that with them, if you don't make an effort to enjoy that thing with them, it can really, really harm your relationship. I don't know if that sounds like a small thing to you, but I think that was a significant reason why I failed as a husband. I, I would have done anything to continue in the relationship, and I had no choice. I just got cut off. But I do know now and, and regret that I was, I didn't live and behave as well as I thought I had. So we can all learn from that lesson, and I pray that in our relationships we can learn from that confession of mine, and that we won't fail in our relationships. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Whatever is the most important thing in that person's life, as long as it's not ungodly, be with them in that. Otherwise they might try to enjoy that thing with somebody else. And that's dangerous in a marriage relationship if that other person is somebody of the opposite sex. 
Let's finish today, though, by rejoicing, not only with Mary, but by rejoicing over what Mary was rejoicing over. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all tears are gone. Because he lives, I can face the future, because I know that Jesus lives. Because he lives, I know that if I die, that's not the end of my life. Because he lives, my loved ones who believed, who went before me, and who will come after me, they can live on forever, and I can be with them forever. Because he lives, rejoice, brethren. Rejoice at this wonderful hope that we have, that we have a God who, who is with us, in us, Talking to our consciences. Leading us. We have a, we have a great God who, who never changes, who we can trust. His love will not fail us. It won't change. Nothing will separate us from the love of God. Rejoice in the goodness of God today. Rejoice that Jesus is alive. One word changed everything for Mary. But it was more, more than just the one word. It was who was speaking that word. Jesus, the resurrected Saviour, the creator of the universe, said her name. And he was alive and powerful. And he is today if anybody here is listening or anybody online later is listening and you have not accepted Jesus as your Savior, if you haven't rejoiced in the fact that you even have a Savior, a wonderful, loving Savior, rejoice today and accept, embrace it. Yes, one word, yes, could change everything for you if you say yes. To Jesus. Amen. Amen. Jesus has more than just one word for us today though. That could change everything for us. Think about some of the things that Jesus has said. He says, come unto me. All you who labor and are heavy laden with burdens and I will give you rest. Take my yoke. Take, take, take my work upon you. And learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and humble and you will find rest you will find rest for your souls oh and Jesus he also said if anyone thirsts if anyone thirsts let him come to me and drink and as the scripture has said out of his heart will flow rivers of of living Water. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger. And he who believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus also has, has this word for us today. He says, deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. And, and he, he says, um, he who... He says, for whoever desires to save his life will lose his life. And whoever loses his life for my sake shall find his life. Shall find eternal life. Jesus also has the word repent. Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. That's a powerful one word that can change everything if we completely turn away from living for ourselves and living instead for Jesus. That one word acted out in our lives for real will change everything. The final word I want to share that Jesus could have for somebody here today. He says, blessed is that servant whose master, when he comes, finds him doing his master's will. Not just knowing about it, not just being a hearer of the word, but being a doer. That is how we need to be prepared. 
for our Lord coming back again. Be found doing his word. That our food, he said, Jesus said, my food is to do the Father's will. Is our food to do the will of Jesus. The closing song today is Revive Us Again. It could have been because he lives. But the closing song is Revive Us Again because Jesus was revived from the dead. Mary was revived in her spirit when she saw that Jesus was alive from the dead. And, and this song says, We praise thee, O God, for the spirit of light who has shown us our Saviour. We praise thee, O Lord, for thy spirit of light who has shown us our Saviour and scattered our night, which means he, all the darkness in our lives, he scattered that. He's, it's gone. Because of his light can scatter any darkness, any problems in our lives. And that's why I've chosen this hymn. May each of us, may our joy be revived today. May our joy be revived today as we rejoice together that Jesus is alive. Amen. Let's stand. Let's sing. Revive us again.